know who Superman is? <laughs> Watch this. Oh! What is going on, guys? It's Brian Jack from Comics, and we are back like we do every week with that new comic book day show. That's right. This is that Bolo show, the Beyond the Lookout, where we cover the first appearances, Reader Buzz books, Variant Buzz books, as well as Jack's long-term play. These are all the books that everyone are talking about that hit comic book shelves this week, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like this is starting to get redundant, but a big comic book day. Um, I think that's because the market is really healthy right now. Um, so there are a lot of different titles that kind of hit that reoccurring interest list, um, whether we're talking about uh, Thor or Venom or uh, some of these hot indie series. They're just, uh, there's some reoccurring themes we see popping up week after week, and this week is no different. Yeah, it always seems like October, November is pretty big. We kind of fizzle out a little bit in December, especially that week of Christmas is usually like very, very slow. But either way, we're going to start right now with those first appearances. First one we got this week, this is the one we talked about on our Final Order Cutoff show, The Last Call. We are talking about Captain Marvel number 23. Oh, man. I got to tell you, this one right here, Brian, is going to be an interesting case, depending upon the success of these characters. So in this issue, you're getting the full appearance of uh, Bridget and uh, the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce these characters. You, you know, you're not hearing them in the, in the story, but um, you're getting the, the first uh, cameo of uh, OVE. Um, and uh, the, I've seen mixed reactions to these characters. Uh, obviously people are pretty excited because the, the issue sold out and the book's selling for about $15. Um, so there is definitely secondary market interest there. Um, you tend to get that on any first new appearance. And I've heard some people say that they think this is going to be like a burn and turn a one week thing. I would caution that. And I know that I can be kind of cynical of first appearances in that manner, but here is why I'm actually intrigued by this one is, is the relation of these characters quite possibly to Namor, I think is, um, is, is intriguing because we know Namor is coming to the MCU. We're, we're very aware of that. We also um, know that this is a character that, while he has a long, rich history in the Marvel Universe, is not a character that the like main kind of core Marvel customer these days is very aware of, um, and certainly not. And we use, this is a term we use uh, on this channel regularly: um, the the world around him. So there's a necessary world building uh, to, that is going into um, kind of shaping out the world of Namor. So. Hey, looking at these kids and especially how it ties into some earlier issues, there's certainly some people um, paying attention to uh, there's an old Avengers issue where it's believed that these characters may tie into um, as well as um, some interest in uh, some other uh, uh, Namor appearances that were showed up in some other books. And it all supposedly ties into this. So, I, you know, we've seen Donny Cates retcon things, bring things back, bring old issues back into uh, focus. We've also seen the popularity of um, characters in coming out of this Captain Marvel series. You know what's going to be the most interesting thing to me, Brian, is the first appearance argument. But moving on into Thor number nine, we get another first appearance, and here we have Dr. Blake as Shadow of Thunder. Yeah, and people were excited about this one, too, and I must admit that this is not um, something I'm, like, super familiar about, so it didn't necessarily, like, the initial um, – information didn't really necessarily pop me get me excited um but thor has been man it's they talk about a consistent issue a consistent read and this is one that has kind of like long-term possibility um because you always got to see where donny Cates is going with things and i think a lot of this thor uh run so far has been set up um i think you know everybody had a lot of high hopes with black winter and then felt like it fell flat but i i really think that we're still kind of in the phase of seeing where this is going to go because if you really look at venom and you compare thor and venom uh venom certainly we started to get very introductory by this point but it wasn't until well into the run where we've started to really get where we're going and even within venom i mean we're 30 issues in and we're, we still have questions right there's still things we're trying to figure out um and and still places we're trying to go and that's kind of the intrigue of of the way Donny cates writes yeah it definitely has a, a layered <laughs> type storytelling which which makes people keep coming back for more not to mention he's a huge solicitor of his own books like right. every issue is the next best one yeah the craziest one he's ever <laughs> yeah i um, mean you know what the funniest thing about him is i don't think that comes from a place of like 
um, being that's honest. just the fanboy in himself. Yeah, exactly. He's so excited by everything that he everything to him is the greatest thing in the world. Um, and if anything, I'm envious of that. Yeah, he's like the kid in Stand By Me who hasn't found his pennies yet. <laughs> <laughs> but the last one we have for first appearance this week, we're getting over to DC. And we got Batman number 102 that gives us that first full appearance of Ghost Maker. Yeah, and I know some people, you know, hate when we put this and we've had to because it's just, you know, what is the community going to deem this? This is not my opinion, for full versus uh, first. I, I like 101. Uh, you know, y- you kind of get that um, cameo. That's kind of the one that people have looked at. But um, either way, you can't really play that that game. So um, this one is obviously, this is the, the, the full appearance, the origin. This is going to be really the ghost maker issue. Um, you certainly get that cover B. That's absolutely amazing. Um, you get that 1 in 25 design variant. Um, that you guys are buying up because Brian and I are joking like at the point where they're doing like Bruce Wayne uh, design variants um, <laughs> yeah. you, you know like you guys are buying up every design variant that's coming out um, from Batman so um, this is another popular one very cool character um, maybe I'm getting desensitized to these James Tyne and Batman characters where I'm starting to feel like uh, you know coming out so fast and furious and they're all very cool um, but it's hard to necessarily know wh- which one is going to have that punchline success versus which one is gonna be the designer. Yeah, pretty soon they're going to have wallpaper variants. <laughs> it's just going to be different samples of wallpaper. And people are gonna go. <laughs> I'll tell you what, one book I would buy a wallpaper variant of is Haunted Mansion. There you go. But, but that's going to wrap up first appearance section. You, the viewer, let us know which of these books did you pick up also, there's some other books on this list that, you know, could have had first appearance in there, but we always put confirmed when this list is, is released, which is usually Tuesday night. But either way, now we're going to move into the Reader Buzz books. First one we're talking about, we've talked a lot on this channel about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but we also now get that return of Jenica with Jenica 2, issue number one. Yeah, and this is going to go further into kind of um, the psyche of jenica like what is jenica have going on um and and, and to be honest with you the the you talk about layered storytelling with donnie pates um the layered storytelling that sophie campbell has been doing in the tmnt ongoing is um some of the i mean it's some of the highest recommended reading i can that's world right building now. right there um, it really is um and it's ballsy world building because it's world building not within a character that we're not familiar with or or a character without a lot of history it's it's world building in a world we are all very very familiar with which is certainly um takes uh a lot of a lot of balls a lot of risk and uh sophie campbell has done a great job yeah a lot of great 80s franchises but we're gonna get into a 90s franchise with this next one I say 90s. It's, it was before that, but well, known in the 90s. We're going over to Boom, and they launched Mighty Morphin number one. That's right. Yeah, but it is, but it is very predominantly a 90s franchise. I still say that, that it, it, that's where it lands. This is a weird release, though. Um, it's like because, a cooler Captain Planet. I'm yeah. <laughs> this is a weird release because you know it's really kind of one half of a total, right? Because there's that Power Rangers number one that's going to drop next week. Um, and there's a part of me that wonders if it wouldn't be better if they were released on the same week. Part of me wonders if you spread them. I don't know. I don't know that the answer to that. Uh, certainly the good folks at Boom Studios. I say two weeks apart. Um, give you a payday. Give you a payday. Between yeah, them. payday break. Right. Well, that's certain. Right. And it's actually a good point if because if you're talking about Power Rangers, we're talking about usually a smaller pool of buyers, but a more hardcore completionist group of buyers and certainly putting together all of these incentives um large ratio incentives which yes. are not typical of the power rangers franchise uh, being attached to this and one thing that's very positive to me is when we started our um a, a, our uh, variant program right and we started talking about goals one of the th- first things you and i talked about was uh power rangers that this is a niche that we saw that we thought wasn't getting the exposure um, that it deserved because of how quality the books were and how quality the artistry that was going into a lot of the variant covers associated with these books. How great is it now to sit here, Brian, months later? Something we haven't even talked about. And, and, and now you're looking at between Power Rangers 55 and now um, 
Mighty Morphin number one, and then the upcoming Power Rangers number one. A number of retailers never associated with Power Rangers have jumped on board and produced exclusive variants um, and, and have brought some of the most amazing cover art and cover artists along with them. And it, and it may be that they were just trying to jump in on some of those incentives. Um, and, you know, it may be it, that in and out cash grab. But I'd like to think that Power Rangers has started to really show um, its validity in the marketplace. And people are really starting to believe that Power Rangers, you know, when I, we first started talking Power Rangers, it wasn't even really looked at as a comic book brand. It was still kind of fitting in that um, TV properties that toys have comic books. Next one we're talking about, we're getting back over to that AWA upshot when the first volume of this came out. It went crazy. And now we're getting Year Zero Volume 2, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, year Zero, it, it seems kind of crazy. We're already on Volume 2 a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, you, you got to remember, this is not a comic book company. We keep saying that about AWA. This is a company that it was created for comic book creators to create pitches that they could then try to bring to Hollywood. These are books that are designed for that. So um, think of volume two, almost season two um, to me. Uh, that's the, kind of the way I'm looking at this. This is kind of a restart point. Uh, it, it, this has been the most popular book of all of the titles that AWA has released. Um, so it being the first to come back to a second volume doesn't surprise me. Um, a little under the radar this week again, I think it falls into their also coming in a week where Thor and Batman, we talk about that plug and play, right? Every week you got to include Thor and Batman. And then you got a big release in Captain Marvel, one that everyone was excited and chasing. Um, and then a huge, huge, huge independent release that definitely had everybody's attention. So there were some major, major releases that are certainly going to capitalize, not just collector interest, but dollars spent by retailers who are stocking those shelves. Yeah, and then we already mentioned one boom book with Mighty Morphin number one, but they had another number one this week with Origins number one. And this is another one I feel like was a victim from the get-go of um, just kind of not finding its own place uh, and, and getting that sort of attention. Boom number one, but uh, it, 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 the market immediately kind of put it into that secondary category of uh, – um, similar to the way it did maybe Folklords a little bit. Uh, and maybe even that isn't quite a, a fair comparison because I think Folklords had a stronger release date um, and a stronger lead up. Um, maybe uh, Skies Over East Berlin type or Alienated, uh, maybe that level of uh, interest. But that doesn't necessarily mean bad book. I've read the first issue. This was a, a very, very interesting first issue. Um, I'm going to continue to read the first arc at the very least. Um, but it's one that's kind of flown under the radar. And you got to remember, you still got the first look deal with Boom. That applies to all books, you know, not just the books that get all the buzz. And a lot of times these books that get options are the ones that don't, right? I mean, how many times have we seen that? And then people are scrambling for copies. Um, so this is one to possibly look at long term. I would pick a copy up and read it if you have. And I, it, it, I think it may, it may surprise some people. Right. Next one, we're getting back into indies, and this is one of our favorite indie publishers, Mad Cave Studios. We got Pantomime number one this week. This is not only one of our favorite publishers with Mad Cave. This is one of the Mad Cave titles I'm most excited to talk about because um, it's a departure from the typical Mad Cave um, release system. First off, it is a um, different kind of book than we've seen Mad Cave release. Now, one thing we've liked about Mad Cave is the fact that they've had a level of fluidity where they've been able to do different types of books, similar to Vault, where you know you don't want to be kind of pegged in as one type of publisher. Um, so Mad Cave has done different stories, and even their their CEO Mark London, he has written different types of stories. Um, and I think that that is is a versatility that um, has boded well for them. But here with Pantomime, you're getting kind of a different feel. This very much feels like. Um, Maybe not an image book, but maybe a vault or aftershock book, which is, I would say, a compliment to Mad Cave because that's to me is this is an elevation title for them. Um, I, I would like to have seen like a lot more press for this. I would like to have seen like a lot more of a push because to me, this is one that they have a chance with because, it, like I said, it, it doesn't look like a Mad Cave title, it looks like a, a more mainstream. And I, I buried the lead on this 
in my opinion, um, this is the first time Mad Cave has kind of gone outside of their like talent search family of, of creators. And they brought in a name creator. Christopher Sabella is a, a, a very, very well-known uh, comic creator who's had a number of um, books that have made uh, noise. It has had books that have been optioned, including his last book, Crowded, which got optioned like day one. Uh, Rebel Wilson snatched that book up uh, from her production company uh, for a project for herself almost immediately. Uh, so that is one of those. She, he's one of those uh, talented, talented creators who kind of is on that like second level of uh, creator owned writer who any of his books could be that next book that gets picked. And if you've ever met Christopher Sabella at a convention, a uh, real funny, likable guy. That's going to wrap up the reader buzz section. So we're going to move right into the variant buzz. First one on the variant buzz section, we got that Stranger Things Dungeons and Dragons number one that covered the homage variant, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, big release uh, coming out of this week, uh, in my opinion, because there is a major thing happening um, with Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is having an incredible riches. Now, never played. A Dungeons and Dragons. I said those things where um, maybe I don't have the uh, uh, creativity, we'll say, to uh, to to handle that one. Celebrities from a weird range of people who have, have really professed an interest in um, D and D and regular play. Um, so uh, it, within a co the comics world, I think there's a lot of room. Um, we certainly see D and D inspiring a lot of comics. Like Die comes to mind, and it seems like. There's several times where we're talking about titles and when we're looking through those solicits and we're trying to find kind of comparative terms and properties, Dungeons and Dragons is one of those ones that comes up. Um, so it, I would pay attention to this one, especially that incentive. Um, it's got a little bit of noise in the market, but I still think it's a sleeper. We've talked about how these IDW incentives, especially these 125s, dry up and then you just cannot get them anymore. All right, but the next one, we're also moving over to Image. Everyone knows about the Department of Truth, but they also had that number one second print that came out this week. Yeah, and this is a little bit of another undercover one, Color Change, uh, which is, you know, not my favorite. I will admit that Color Change slate printings are starting to catch up to the rest of the late printings. Um, so that's a positive sign, but um, either way, I think this one will be lower printed. This is probably more of a reader release to... to, to get the books in the hands of anybody who didn't get a chance to read, especially as uh, issue two just dropped, uh, had a lot of interest, especially with that 125 incentive. Um, I think there's going to be interest in this series throughout. Uh, certainly it's going to be a lot of controversy. It's going to be a lot of things people talk about. And uh, just from our experience working with the editorial staff to create an exclusive for issue number one, they definitely have the marketing of this book down there's going to be a lot of covers a lot of artists you've heard of a lot of um they're, they're, they're certainly going to promote the hell out of this one so i think department of truth isn't going anywhere i think this is going to be a a major player in creator owned comics uh for a little while yeah it kind of reminds me of like how east of east of west was the next one is also an image book and we got that savage dragon 252 second print yeah they're continuing to come with um these kind of like crazy unique um, covers taking a page from uh, maybe Ice Cream Man a bit. Um, we saw the uh, the Joe Biden and Kamala Harris um, get out the vote uh, endorsement cover, um, which certainly had people talking in both directions, which I think was the intention from Eric Larson. And then now you kind of come with a whole different vibe with Charlie Brown um, and, uh, you know, certainly Peanuts. Um, uh, it has a fan base that is is diehard, similar to like Brian, your passion for Disney stuff. Um, that certainly our uh, uh, our old partner with uh, ComicBookInvest.com, uh, Ben C. Ben Kales, is one of the biggest Peanuts fans that I've ever met, um, and I, I'm sure he was excited to see this cover. Um, and uh, it seems like more and more people are, are taking from this though. This, this thing that Ice Cream Man has kind of discovered this like, well, if you take these like kind of wild properties and mix them with these kind of like mundane uh, children's stories that we all know that it kind of hits on a note because I noticed that Dynamite uh, number two, which we'll, we'll be talking about next week, has a, a number of incentives that homage uh, both uh, uh, 
Peanuts and uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. Seuss. So uh, it seems like uh, every publisher now is going ahead and, and making their mark with this kind of um, uh, book. Now this it's always this, that, this it's always that copycat marketing. Yeah, and that usually kills a trend, right? And 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 also like this book isn't pop, maybe as well as say that initial Ice Cream Man because people saw this coming, right? Um, I remember when you messaged me when you first saw the Ice Cream Man cover, you you called it, you knew it, you knew it. You said, this is going to pop in the secondary market. And we both jumped on it from a pre-order standpoint. Um, but it's funny now how, now that publishers are onto it, retailers are also onto it. So this book was ordered. People knew that this uh, Savage Dragon book, even re you know people who aren't regular Savage Dragon buyers were going to pay attention to it. Next one we're talking about, we've talked about these a lot on the last call, final cutoff show as well. We're talking about those Marvel, those Native American variants. Yeah, and, you know, this has been kind of widely uh, loved variant set. Um, Marvel cover bees, uh, when they do these, like, variant programs, uh, people tend to cringe because it's just yeah, a whole lot of... they always system. suck. <laughs> yeah, there's sometimes you get some great art every now and again, like with like some of those Venomized covers, but you just become desensitized to it because there's so many of them. So, yeah, the, your end result ends up being you see them everywhere. You get so freaking sick of them. Um, I, I remember when, like, those Venomized were out. It got to a point where I got tired of flipping through boxes and seeing them. I got tired of seeing them in my own boxes. Um, I just, you got sick of them. Uh, and and I think that's kind of the sentiment that ends up happening. Having said that, um, I spent some time doing some research over various Marvel variants this weekend. Um, a lot of those weird cover bees are coming back into focus as they start to dry up on the marketplace. Um, but this is a different beast, Brian, because this is this has been universally um, liked from the moment they got released. First off, unique cover art, colorful, different. Um, those are things that are always going to draw people's attention. Um, also, that Native American art style, it's popular. It's always been popular. We see it in clothing. We see it in tattooing. Um, it's, it's, it's always kind of had a style uh, and certainly the color combinations. But also tying into the representation and inclusion um, issues that have kind of plagued comics for a long time that Marvel has really been working to kind of get caught up on and get back in. And um, they worked so hard in so many different communities like the Hispanic community and the African-American community. And really the Native American community um, has been kind of long overlooked and, 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 and certainly with uh, um, all hail to your Washington football team and some of the uh, movement going on in the, uh, in the, in the country, um, there's an increased sensitivity and, and kind of desire to show honor and tribute to these native Americans and make sure that um, we all are um, kind of treating them with the same class and respect that we're, we're trying to treat everybody else. So getting this kind of attention has been great. All of the native American, uh, uh, members of the comic community have been very excited. I can't think of anyone more than Carolina Chris 26, who has been uh, all over this. And Jeffrey Re Reggie has even uh, retweeted him and tweeted him. Um, so very, very cool uh, to see that level of excitement. Um, and this is one of those cover B sets that I think you're going to see these. They won't be like hard to get. Um, but I do think we'll have some value long term, if nothing else. We're comic fans. We all buy beautiful cover art. These are unique and really beautiful cover art. And I hope that it puts the artist on the map because he's done a lot of good stuff for a long time, a lot of unique uh, pieces. And I think that this is a great showcase of his work. Yeah, the, we've talked about it on last call about how all these covers look gorgeous. And I think while some of them, like you said, with them, they might not be hard to find, but I think there's going to be one or two, especially for those completionists that want the, of yeah. those whole sets. There's going to be a couple out there that might be lower printed that might be harder to come by. Especially some of those that. tier ones after dealers already have some sitting on shelves and they're like, ah, do I really need to order another Native American variant? And they'll leave that one off the order form and then sure. Next one, we're sticking with Marvel, but we got that Thor number two. It's got a sixth print. Right. Plug and play release. We're going to keep talking about this book. Um, late printings, getting huge numbers, but there's a valid reason. Um, this is an issue that ties into Black Winter. Um, has a, a cameo, I think it's called. Um, uh, I, whatever the, they're, they're labeling it these days, but I think it's labeled a cameo. On top of which, 
Um, my, my two favorite things is we've certainly seen a lot of crossover talk going on between Marvel and DC. We saw what happened in the uh, DC death metal multiverse one shot um, with, I don't care what you want to call it. That's Cosmic Ghost Rider showing up in the DC universe. Um, and then very, very, very plainly in this issue, we see streaks of light, which are told to us by the narrator to basically be Superman and, and, and uh, the Green Lantern and uh, the Flash and Wonder Woman um, right here in Thor 2. And on top of that, if that wasn't enough, as hot as Strange Academy is, this issue is a preview that predates Strange Academy's first appearance um, for Strange Academy number one. So this is a one of those kind of like cameo appearances of, of Strange Academy. It could be a first full appearance if you like to use the same logic apparently that we used with DC Presents 26, but yet we don't apply to any other book ever that ever gets released. Um, or, uh, you know, if at nothing else, it's just if you're bullish about strange academy it's a a nice addition so this is a thor 2 in general is a big book i will buy any printing they do of it and i think because of that a lot of people in the market are um for at least one of those three reasons and add in some of the cool cover art they've done for some of these reprints um you know we'll see how high they can get and we've seen some of these high ones uh recently uh uh, once in future, like their sixth, seventh, and eighth prints are doing incredible. Like some of these high, high, high late printings really start to get astronomical in price because while I may be excited to keep getting new uh, Thor 2 covers, I know some of you are like, I am freaking done with this book. I don't care. So uh, uh, because of that, each individual cover gets a smaller and smaller print run. Yeah. And I also think there's once in future later prints are smaller, smaller, smaller than a Marvel Thor title. Oh, no doubt. Oh, <laughs> there's no doubt about that. But, and also, I don't care if, I mean, it's great it might have a previous Strange Academy, but I'm not boating on it being a first appearance of Strange Academy on the sixth print of a title that's come out months after months Strange later, Academy right. number one has. But, but like I said, that's just one bullet in your yeah. gun. You got two yeah. other bullets in that book. There's people that they are going to want all those later printings. But. Yeah. Moving on, though, the next one, we'll get back over to Boom for a minute. We got that Buffy number 19 that has that gorgeous peach momoko. Yes, I said it, gorgeous peach momoko. There's some momoko I don't like, but I actually like this cup. And I was really thinking hard about um, peach today. I was halfway through that sentence, and I was like, this is going to come off weird. <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was thinking hard about peach momoko today. Um, and I was thinking about some of the people who have – sort of opposed her ascension to her current place in comics. I'm not saying that, that you fall into that category, Brian, but some of the similar criticisms, I would have to argue um, in Peach's defense that I would say over the last couple months, she has not dropped one of those covers that you go, mm, she mailed that in, she did that in five minutes. Um, I think that uh, first off, I know for a fact from her husband, who is her manager and a very prominent member of social media, that they, they're very aware of the criticism that they get uh, and sometimes maybe a little sensitive to it. Um, and because of that, uh, I think that Peach has really focused in on trying to make sure she delivers on some of these. So we've seen more and more covers hitting. This is a home run. Um, this is a home run to a level, Brian, that's going to get Buffy attention. And Go look at, remember when we were talking about, well, I think it was Buffy 15, that Justine Franny, Franny. won in 15 incentive. Have you seen what that Franny incentive is selling for? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about like 100 plus. Uh, uh, it, is, it is dried up in, in huge demand. I think this book ha can do some of that. Now, there's a cover B and an incentive, and that always kind of hurts both covers. But universally liked cover art uh, uh, a popular character um, in a series, if 19, uh, but certainly not one that's going to be heavily, heavily ordered. So for those Momoko com completionists, this is one to pay attention to. Yeah, I, I like the cover. I didn't, I didn't buy it. I didn't pre-order it just because I'm not a big Buffy fan. So um, Buffy fans out there and, the, and people that did got it, did it because they like Peach Momoko art. So there's fans of the art. And then, like you said, there's Buffy fans out there too. Me personally, I'm not a Buffy fan, so I, I, I didn't 
go after this one. But the next one also, we talked about that Thor later printings, but we also get some Venom late prints that came out this week. Yeah, and these Venom late prints, you know, we grew group them up together because there's several of them um there's not any one thing about any one issue that really stands out and says well, well we should talk about this but it, it's certainly not something we can omit from the list because first off you guys were talking about them on social media you guys are interested in them and these are really long-term plays i think at this point um I, 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 this isn't something i've said before but i've really stopped trying to put these late printings as long-term plays because the reality is i can do that every week um Late printings have become such great. Any, I'll be honest with you, I've been buying late printing since uh, 2015, 20, around that area. I started really getting heavy into buying late printings. I, some of my most profitable sales that I'm making right now are from late printings I bought two and three years ago. And I really think that that's a trend that has an opportunity to continue as late printings have only gotten kind of cooler in the cover art uh, recently. Um, so Venom being as popular a series as it is, the run of issues that are reprinted here are some of the key and most popular issues. Um, and then we've talked about, you know, it doesn't matter how many printings they do of books. People want all these covers. These are looked at as variants there and the scarcity is important. Um, and I think there's gonna be some really long-term value and attention placed on this. Now, will there be too many late printings and will some of this start to erode? Absolutely, that is gonna happen, um, but, we talk about it all the time from a lottery ticket standpoint for the cost of a, a cover price book. Um, you've seen some of these late printings hit multiple hundreds of dollars when there's no event of that issue, just the scarcity alone causing that, um, that you can't even predict that. So uh, that's one of those things kind of to pay attention to and be on the lookout for. And either way, um, this is great too, because a lot of people are reading this Venom series. And a lot of people may sleep on stuff and they hear about stories late, especially like this Kodak story. Some of these first printings hit like big money. So having these late printings are great because it gets that books in the hands of readers, which is essential. Yes, you can read via digital. Uh, yes, there's those terrible websites you can steal comics from. But at the same point, um, the reality is there's still so many of us that love to have that floppy in our hand. Uh, and that's the reading experience that we kind of choose and go for it. And this is still a great tool for that customer. I like that floppy just in the bag and board and not touched and then read the digital copy. There you go. <laughs> Unless it's yeah. a trade paperback or omnibus or something like that. But uh, that's yeah, the last uh, one we have for that variant bus section though, we're sticking with Venom and we got that web of Venom Empire's End number one. We got the RB Silver variant. But yeah, we're still getting these Empire's End tie-ins. Uh, it certainly feels like this is the Empire that will not end. I don't know. Um, I was like, when this all, when this over a while ago? <laughs> right, right. Um, and I think that's part of the problem where some of like the lack of interest uh, lies. It, you know, it's a Venom book, but it's not really a Venom book. And I think mentally people are on King of Black, so. Um, I think that that's kind of the issue, but uh, certainly a variant play that people were paying attention to. So far, we've gone through the first appearances, those reader buzz, the variant buzz. Let us know what books you guys have been picking up. But for now, we're going to get into Jack's long-term play. And you might have guessed it by now. It's the one book that we haven't talked about this week. We've talked about a bunch of Donny Cates, but we haven't talked about this one. And we're talking images crossover number one. Yeah, and it's really hard to project uh, independent comics as long-term plays. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, and I know there's some people in the community that are going to automatically disqualify them, which I certainly and wholeheartedly do agree with that. Um, if, in fact, if we're talking about projects that are kind of like tabbed for film or or television independent comics are far uh kind of quicker moving than anything from the big two in in that uh, uh aspect but having said that that's not even really my excitement over this book my excitement over this book is the general interest that this book is drawn from a reader buzz standpoint 150,000 copies ordered and certainly um, when you release a 1 in 200 variant a 1 in 100 a 175 1 in 50 a 1 in 125 and a 1 in 10 as well as a number of retailer exclusives which all grab those incentives 
you're going to drive up the price uh, and the print run. Um, and certainly if you're looking at the price of incentives and you're saying, well, Jack, these incentives aren't performing, they're not hitting ratio. Well, that's going to happen when you have the number of um, exclusives that you have. And it's speaking as somebody who uh, uh, helped to produce an exclusive for this book with the 616 comics, uh, the crossover number one Megan Hutchinson variant, um, this was a no brainer book to do an exclusive for. It's a Donnie Cates number one, it's Image Comics. Um, it, it, it was a and it was a book you knew was going to sell and sell out. Um, so the interest here, uh, this is Last Action Hero uh, meets comics. This is uh, what if the the worlds inside your comics suddenly came out of the comics and into the real world. Um, and while issue number one may have disappointed some, I heard some some negative reviews. It's one of those things where we've talked about the layered storytelling of Donny Cates. If you haven't read a lot of Donny Cates comics, I that still does love not. Him, Right, it does not just apply to his um, to his big two stuff. His storytelling style it, it really takes form as well in his creator owned. And so, um, for me, crossover is one that like the concept is is very interesting to me. Beyond the concept being interesting to me, the way the market responded to that book, um, I don't agree with those conspiracy theorists that think that this book is going to lead to this Marvel and DC crossover. Um, having said that, that's certainly one hell of a chip in your back pocket. If that ever happens for anyone who ever invested in this book, this would make that long-term play. I don't care. It's a, you can say there's 150,000 print run, right? If this is the book that spawns the Marvel DC crossover, 150,000 ain't anywhere near close enough uh, to what would be needed to satisfy that sort of demand. So I don't worry about that. Plus, once again, when you look at the exclusives, most of them have sold out from most retailers. Now, I don't know too many retailers still sitting there holding a lot of copies. Um, and as have happened with the 616 comics and our variant, um, it's now selling for well over the original price on the secondary market. Um, and I think that is indicative of the fact, again, that there's a lot of those exclusive uh, uh, incentives. Some of the exclusive covers are actually more limited than some of the incentive covers. So that's just what you're seeing first day stuff. You can't read too much into that. And that's the point of a long-term play. We're taking all of that first day release day information out. And we're just looking at a book and a property for um, it's, if you're looking at it just for its importance, for its, um, its relevance, uh, the way that it's, it's, um, kind of been the focus of the comic industry, at least this week, but it's certainly within creator owned independent comics for a while, building on the momentum of Department of Truth, um, building on the momentum of We Only Find Them When They're Dead, and building on the momentum of Seven Secrets. We've seen these creator owned series from two different companies. Each one has piggybacked off of the previous one's sales number and put up a higher and higher and higher number. I think Berserker in uh, like January, February from Boom Studios with Matt Kent and Keanu Reeves is going to be that next one. It's going to be real interesting. Can they put up a number that draws higher than this 150,000 print run from Downey Cates? I don't know, um, but I think it's quite possible. But the comic market is healthy. Um, so this number doesn't scare me. If anything, it just shows the interest in this title. Um, I like cover A for the reason that we have talked about, about cover A's. Um, when this book gets national media attention, that is the cover that tends to be shown. There's amazing cover art from all of the covers, whether we're talking regular price or incentive or exclusive. Um, there's amazing cover art everywhere. But uh, cover A, if you're looking for like your cheapest kind of buy-in, that's one I grab. And that's one that's regularly available and plentifully available. By the way, there's even dealers running still to this day, even, even on release day. There's dealers who ordered this heavy for the incentive play. And because of that, they're ready to dump those cover A's at below cover price. I've seen, uh, if you go on eBay, you'll see blocks of 10 and things like that. Take advantage of these opportunities. This window where these, this book is that accessible and that cheap uh, will not last forever. We saw this exact same thing with Something's Killing the Children, number one. We saw the same thing with Once in Future, number one. Uh, we saw the same thing with those previous releases I just named uh, from this year. And eventually, all of those sell out, all of those dry up, all of those go up in value. And I think this will be no different. 150000 does not scare me. Uh, the different thing about supply and demand is it, you got to remember the demand. So everybody tends to talk about supply and demand, Brian, but they only ever want to reference supply. Uh, so it, we talk about it with things like Venom. Uh, the first appearance of Venom is one of the most readily supplied books there is. It's the first appearance of uh, Deadpool. 
same deal, but people want that book. And you can have a first appearance with only a 500 print run. Uh, but guess what? If nobody gives a good darn about that character, they're not going to buy it and it's not going to go up in value. So crossover is one I think that is going to get people's attention. And then last but not least, uh, I, I really think if you've ever remember that movie, Last Action Hero, that was a big movie in the 90s. Um, I certainly think a, 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 stunk. a you, it stunk in retrospect, but it, in the moment, it was a big I'm pretty movie. sure that movie flopped, by the way. It may be, it may have flopped, but it was a big movie. It was, but it was big, Arnold. And it was Arnold kids. in the heyday yeah. of Arnold. It was Arnold when everything Ar Arnold did was huge. Um, and all of the flopped and mistakes of that movie, um, I don't think it's the concept that's the flop. I think it's the execution. That was in the corny and camp era of, of action movies. Um, I think there's potential with this concept and what Donnie Cates is doing and the fact that it is familiar to people where uh, this could be a property that we see in another form of media um, that I, I certainly think would be insane. Uh, it would be expensive to, 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 pick, to, to, to depict, but we've seen with the boys that you can do superhero stuff and still have it be grounded and realistic. So I like this. I like this one. I'm, I'm excited from it from a reader buzz standpoint. I can't wait to continue to read it. Um, have patience if you're investing in this one. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's not for you, it's not for you. I understand it. But uh, I, the print, if the only reason you're going to tell me that is the print run alone, um, that is getting to be a tired, tired argument. I like this book, but. We've also talked about, you know, hey, it could be the next Walking Dead. And when I say it could be the next Walking Dead, I want it to be the next, like, Walking Dead. I want it to be the next Savage Dragon. I want it to be the next Spawn. I want another image title that goes over 100 issues. Yeah. Uh, is crossover that title? I don't know, but I like to pick it up. And you, you make all those points for long-term play, especially for value. And, but yeah. I also like it from long-term play. It's, it's a story that is going to be one issue in, I enjoyed the first issue. I, we're going to see where it goes. But hopefully it's one of those series that builds on, its, on itself. And, and long-term wise, it's one of those stories you always look back on and go, man, that crossover number one, that started where we are today. Whether we get that way or not, who knows? But I'm, I'm, yeah, hopeful. I'm hopeful. Yeah. But there it is, guys. There's the Bolo list for this week. Let us know what books you guys picked up. Let us know what books you picked up that aren't even on this list because there's a bunch of other ones. Who picked up? U.S. Agent. What did you guys think of U.S. Agent? There is one that I've heard mixed reviews about as well. Our good buddy Arun is a big U.S. Yeah, Agent. Yeah, right. Shout out to Arun. He loves U.S. Agent. But with that being said, guys, this is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video. Bitch, I got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems. I solve them. I run through the money. The pressure be calling. Left on my blessings. I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage. I'm going through something. That's why I ain't calling. Phone in progression. It's all that I wanted. The phone in affection. I summon and double. Cause bitch, I got.